Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I'm the program manager for the Maiden Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Cherikawa for hosting today's session, Anti-Rheumatic Meds Overview for the Non-Rheumatologist with Dr. Catherine Upchurch. Dr. Upchurch retired in 2019 from the UMass Medical Center where she was the clinical chief of rheumatology for over 10 years. She is a professor of medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and she's been a leader in the Massachusetts Medical Society and the American College of Rheumatology and was selected in 2017 to be an ACR master. In 2015, the New England chapter of the Arthritis Foundation honored her with the Marion Ropes Award given to one, given to one area rheumatologist annually for excellence in arthritis care. And we are so very lucky to have her as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Upchurch, when you're ready, please begin. Sure. Um, well, I'm very happy to be here today, and uh, I hope you have your roller skates on because this is a, a chocked full talk with a lot of information, and you may need to go back uh, later and refer to the slide deck uh, to review some of it. Um, these are my disclosures, uh, accreditation. Uh, the objectives are as uh, shown here. And we are going to focus on as many of the anti-rheumatic drugs as I can get through, uh, including indications, common adverse effects, and particularly the role of primary caregivers in monitoring and maybe on occasion prescribing anti-rheumatic drugs. So an anti-rheumatic drug, uh, from a definition point of view, um, addresses rheumatic disease. And rheumatic disease is a disease which affects and usually cause pain redness, warmth, and swelling in joints and peripheral articular structures such as tendons, ligaments, bones, and muscles. Anti-rheumatic drugs obviously produce demonstrable, sometimes sustained, sometimes not, symptomatic benefit in patients with rheumatic disease. Now, over the years, uh, as one might imagine, due to uh, it, a great deal of advancing science in the area, um, there are many uh, new drugs that have been developed that fall within the classification of anti-rheumatic drugs. Um, uh, the broad uh, classification includes rapidly acting anti-inflammatory drugs. Now these are drugs that are adjunctive therapy without the potential to prevent joint damage if used in the long haul. And then the second, uh, broad classification are disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, which we lovingly called DMARDs. Now, all of these drugs may reduce or prevent joint damage and preserve joint integrity and function, and this is variable depending upon individual patient response. These drugs in the past have been called slow-acting anti-rheumatic drugs because they don't take effect immediately, and sometimes it takes a uh, three to four weeks or even longer to uh, see direct benefit. So I did say that this would be a case-based approach and this is case one. Um, a 35 year old man presents to your office after twisting his left knee in a fall. Past history is pertinent for the fact that he was born with one kidney, but he's had normal renal function throughout his life. On exam, his knee showed full range of motion and there's slight pain on motion and he has a small effusion. The best approach from a therapeutic point of view is shown here and you are to select and remember uh, which of these you would choose and we'll come back to this uh, at the end of this section of the talk. Now, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, otherwise known as NSAIDs, uh, are a conventional non-selective cycle, conventional or selective. Now conventional is the original uh, broader class uh, and it's a non-selective cyclooxygenase uh, inhibitor. And these include uh, many different drugs as we'll see. And many of these also are available in low doses over the counter. Um, the second uh, group of NSAIDs are known as selective COX-2 inhibitor uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. In the past, there have been many drugs that have been uh, in this uh, category, uh, but only celecoxib have 
has uh, withstood the test of time due to adverse effects. And uh, Biox is probably the one that many of you have heard of and may even still have some in your drawer. Extraordinarily effective and compared to other um, COX-2 inhibitors, extraordinarily laden with uh, side effects for which reason after uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, scrutiny, it was withdrawn from the market now probably 10 to 15 years ago. Um, the common oral NSAIDs are listed here and I've circled celecoxib or Celebrex. Um, all of these can be prescribed and are available. Some uh, are more common than others. Interestingly, in Europe and in Africa, meloxicam seems to be the most commonly available and prescribed one. And if you notice, ibuprofen uh, here can be given uh, up to 3,200 milligrams a day. And the over-the-counter ibuprofen um, which is uh, known as Advil or Motrin, uh, comes in 200 milligram uh, tablets. So you can actually take a full anti-inflammatory strength by just loading up on a, uh, a number of different Advil or Motrin a day. So the bottom line is that these drugs can be toxic uh, if somebody grabs a bottle and takes a prescribed dose without anybody following them. And this is problematic as we'll see. Um, so you really need to use NSAIDs with caution in all patients. And so that's why I've put this slide on board because it seems very uh, common and easy to say, oh, just take some Motrin, but you really need to explore with your patient both his or her history and also propensity for uh, adverse effects. Generally speaking, the lower the dose, the less likely uh, there will be adverse effects, thus uh, the uh, ability to use these in uh, uh, over-the-counter uh, preparations. So what are the adverse events to uh, NSAID use? Uh, basically, most of the adverse events are related to the mechanism of action. So gastrointestinal, as you probably know, is the most, most significant uh, class of uh, adverse uh, effects. And this is due to the fact that it uh, inhibits uh, COX-2 and uh, more so than uh, COX plus 1-2. Uh, one plus two, and the the agents, uh, the the side effects that we see include esophagitis, gastritis, peptic ulcers, colitis, and it's of note that there have been a number of studies that have shown that elderly females are at greatest risk, um, and that has some therapeutic implications, as you'll see. Um, renal uh, issues are another broad category of adverse events that occur in patients who take. Uh, NSAIDs, and acute renal injury due to decreased renal plasma blood flow um, basically predisposes to adverse events. So if a patient is volume depleted and has a swollen knee and you give the patient um, a high dose or even a therapeutic dose of an NSAID, that patient is more likely uh, to uh, develop renal injury as a, as a result. Um, the other uh, issue is that patients can in an allergic type fashion, develop acute interstitial nephritis, which is really an idiosyncratic reaction. Uh, and it manifests exactly uh, as you would expect with proteinuria and progressive renal insufficiency. Uh, and any of the uh, anti-inflammatory drugs can cause renal failure. With response to gastrointestinal uh, problems, the COX-2 selective inhibitor of celecoxib is far less likely to cause the uh, particularly PUD and gastritis because it uh, selectively uh, inhibits uh, uh, and um, there's still site of protection in the stomach of, of the uh, cyclooxygenases that are uh, present and are not inhibited. Uh, patients who take anti-inflammatory drugs can develop increased bleeding due to uh, inhibition of platelet cyclooxygenase inhibition. And um, this leads to decreasing thromboxane A2, and patients can have vigorous bleeding. Also, um, this would uh, be particularly true in patients who have uh, von Willebrand's disease, who have low platelet counts for any reason, uh, because if the platelets are inhibited and they're not many of them or the ones that are there don't work, this becomes clinically much more relevant. Um, finally, uh, another thing that a lot of people don't know about is that patients who uh, do have a history of asthma can have exacerbation of underlying as asthma if prostaglandins are blocked and leukotrienes are relatively increased. Uh, 
and that can cause a severe asthmatic attack. Um, and then there's the issue of um, adverse effects that are totally unrelated, unrelated to a mechanism of action. And the most concerning was one is that people who have a history of aspirin uh, allergy, true allergy, um, are highly likely to have frank anaphylaxis if they take any of the anti-inflammatory drugs. So it really behooves uh, people who give these agents uh, to patients to understand their patient's past history, to understand their clinical state, and also to understand the mechanism of action of these drugs uh, in order to try to reduce the likelihood of side effects. Um, this is probably one of the most widely prescribed anti uh, uh, sorry, widely prescribed class of medications uh, overall, and um, literally millions of patients take these drugs every day. So probably in the greater scheme of things, they're relatively safe, but the problems can be cat catastrophic and can be easily preventable if there's some thought that goes into uh, taking a good history, um, uh, learning about patients' past medical history, understanding their present status, and responding to epidemiologic uh, factors that might make them at uh, increased risk, such as in the setting of older females. So let's go back to case one. So the 35-year-old man presents to your office after twisting his knee. Well, uh, because you took a good past history, you knew that he was born with only one kidney, um, even though he had normal renal function. It would be definitely not in his best interest if you used an anti-inflammatory drug because of the propensity to um, have renal issues, which could have catastrophic consequences because he doesn't have the usual um, reserve. And so you'd like to avoid all of the anti-inflammatory drugs. Therefore, acetaminophen to, to achieve adequate pain control is uh, the appropriate best approach. And in his case, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs should be completely avoided. The practical implications uh, of the things that I've rushed through, and hopefully you uh, can keep up with this uh, uh, broad brushstroke overview, is to avoid NSAIDs in patients who are volume depleted or have chronic renal insufficiency, or the elderly who generally do have more risk for renal disease. Also avoid uh, these drugs in patients who've had a history of active peptic ulcer disease because they're more likely to develop again develop this problem again, always offer these drugs with food, and always, uh, now we know, give these with PPIs in elderly individuals unless there's a contraindication uh, for this. If there is, I would just avoid the anti-inflammatory drugs because they're generally speaking uh, other drugs that can be used instead. Um, these drugs have to be used with caution in patients with thromb thrombocytopenia or with a history of bleeding disorders. A trick is that you can off offer celecoxib if you need to use NSAIDs um, because celecoxib does not have the same antiplatelet effect. Um, but you have to be careful in monitoring in patients who are on uh, warfarin because the warfarin level can go up uh, and as celecoxib displaces uh, warfarin from its binding sites. So patients may still get into trouble with bleeding even though they have uh, celecoxib on board. Uh, if they have thrombocytopenia because of the uh, uh, displacement of warfarin if they are taking that. Um, it's very important to use these drugs as, with great caution if you have a history of asthma. And also it's really an absolute contraindication in patients with a history of aspirin allergy. Um, in the past, the patients have been offered these drugs if, if these two categories have been problematic in the ER under supervision. But I just think there's so many other uh, drugs that can usually achieve what you want without turning to NSAIDs. So I would just say that this is an absolute uh, contraindication. Um, corticosteroids is one of the other uh, uh, drugs in this class. Um, and I have to say that giving a lecture on corticosteroids probably would take way more than two um, um, additional lecture periods. Uh, but I am going to mention them just for comprehensive uh, uh, overview's sake. And I would say that this, like NSAIDs, is one of the most widely prescribed drugs on the market. It has multiple uses, as you know. There is a, a definite distinction between low-dose short-term and high-dose long-term adverse effects. Um, in general, it's uh, said that 
and there's data to back this up that low dose prednisone, five to 7.5 milligrams a day, uh, even for long periods of time are associated with a much more favorable adverse effect profile. Whereas high dose long-term uh, corticosteroids are uh, definitely problematic with a whole variety of, uh, of uh, metabolic CNS, osteoporosis, uh, and infectious con consequences. Um, in low dose, we see some weight gain, we see some osteopenia, and it's important to remember that even low dose prednisone can lead to uh, rapid bone loss and bone density should be done in patients and followed carefully. Um, I think uh, prednisone, if it's being offered for an anti-rheumatic disease, it, for anti-rheumatic treatment and for rheumatic disease is a good reason to um, consult rheumatology, even if the patient begins to feel better because uh, rheumatologists are experts uh, at both identifying patients at risk, doing the appropriate screening uh, for adverse effects, and also tapering patients off, which is uh, often problematic. And that's really all I'm going to say about corticosteroids, although if uh, anyone's interested, uh, one of our endocrinologists or myself or other rheumatologists can give some much more extensive uh, lectures on this uh, extraordinary drug, uh, which has been one of the mainstays of treating patients with rheumatic disease for years. Now, back to the classification. So we've talked rapidly about rapidly active anti-inflammatory drugs. We've briefly mentioned some uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug facts. We've brushed over corticosteroids well, with the understanding that this is a uh, class that's too big to present in the context of this talk. But the rest of the uh, talk is going to be spent uh, mentioning uh, issues surrounding the use of disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And this is really the mainstay of rheumatology in terms of treatment. Now, all of these drugs may reduce or prevent joint damage, preserve joint integrity and function to a variable disease degree. And these drugs are not, in contrast to the first category, fast-acting. These drugs are slow-acting and may take, as I said, weeks sometimes even a few months to, to take effect. Um, the drugs that are within uh, this class have really uh, revolutionized the uh, treatment of uh, particularly rheumatoid arthritis and related diseases, have rendered patients who have uh, this disease uh, much more functional, have allowed them to work, uh, to raise families, and to lead highly successful lives for the most part. We aren't at the place yet where we believe we can cure uh, rheumatic diseases as we choose, but we're getting close. And that's because of the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. So this is an exciting class and uh, we're continuing to see these drugs developed literally on a weekly basis. So if we look at the overview of disease modifying Buying drugs in 2023, uh, like the broad group that we're discussing of anti-rheumatic disease, anti-rheumatic drugs, there are a number of obvious uh, ways to break this down and to consider these drugs. First of all, we uh, have what are known as the traditional or synthetic disease-modifying drugs. And these are drugs that we'll spend a little bit of time talking about, but the most uh, well-known one is methotrexate, uh, which was a uh, when I uh, started practice rheumatology uh, too many years ago to count, was not available uh, as an FDA approved drug. Uh, and the only drugs that we could really turn to for disease modification were drugs like oral and intramuscular gold, uh, which were somewhat effective, but highly toxic. Uh, when these drugs were introduced uh, to, to treat uh, psoriasis, Many rheumatologists uh, jumped on the bandwagon and even without FDA approval began to use them to treat rheumatoid arthritis, and that's still the case today, although uh, they're much more uh, better understood and obviously now uh, FDA approved uh, in low doses for treatment of a rheumatic disease. This is a second case. Um, a 33-year-old woman presents to her nurse practitioner complaining of nausea. Uh, 
past history was pertinent for longstanding uh, psoriatic arthritis, which was well controlled with adalimumab and methotrexate. Um, no other medical problems. Uh, pregnancy test uh, at the time of the visit was positive, despite the fact that the patient had been using an IUD and her last menstrual period was six weeks ago. So again, as in the first case, choose one of these options and uh, write down what you chose or remember. Uh, you could stop methotrexate and continue adalimumab. You could stop adalimumab and continue methotrexate. You could continue both adalimumab and methotrexate. You could discontinue both adalimumab and methotrexate. And you could consult her rheumatologist and just pick any that might apply as far as you know. So methotrexate, as I mentioned, is uh, a traditional synthetic disease modifying drug. It had been widely used to treat certain kinds of cancer uh, in one of the uh, most widely used uh, anti-breast cancer regimes, but the dose is many, many fold higher than the dose that is uh, effective in patients with rheumatic disease. Uh, for that reason, uh, it is far better tolerated and it's often used in combination with other traditional and biologic DMARDs as well as uh, other NSAIDs and or corticosteroids. Uh, it is the most important and effective of the traditional DMARDs and it's often, as I said, used in combination. And the combination of these drugs often is better than methotrexate alone. Uh, it's excreted 90% uh, unchanged. It's highly protein bound. And those have consequences as far as the adverse effects. Uh, it's a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor. And I want to emphasize to you that it's given as low dose once weekly PO or sub-Q with folic acid. Uh, and if, if you do give the drug in this way with folic acid, you're gonna reduce the adverse effect profile considerably. Now, in general, low-dose methotrexate, anywhere from 7.5 to 15 milligrams once weekly is well tolerated. Uh, the adverse effects include nausea, stomatitis, diarrhea, abnormal liver function tests. Uh, we see anywhere from one to two times uh, normal uh, commonly without necessarily uh, finding any uh, significant liver disease. Uh, and it, it's not surprising if you see that. If uh, values are consistently abnormal more so than that, uh, you have to be a bit worried. Uh, it is a myelosuppressant drug and also um, adverse effects can be accentuated by use with other uh, DHTF inhibitors, especially Bactrim, uh, which is uh, trimethoprim, trimethoprim sub sulfasalazine. Uh, it is also uh, associated with more adverse effects in patients with either pre-renal or renal insufficiency because uh, the kidney uh, is the root of the substantial uh, um, uh, filtration of the drug. And when the kidneys aren't work working, the, the dose that the body sees is uh, progressively um, higher than we expect or would like to count on. And this has implications we'll see in terms of uh, using it in patients with renal issue issues. Um, Low-dose methotrexate can cause congenital birth defects and also uh, can lead to spontaneous abortions. Now, this is an interesting slide uh, that I found that shows what happens when you give um, trimethoprim sulfur to a patient on even low-dose methotrexate. Um, and so the combination was started here on day one. And uh, basically, you can see that when this was recognized, uh, by the time it was recognized, she had uh, leukopenia and um, she... Uh, was advised to stop the methotrexate and she was treated with IV folinic acid, at which point um, the white count went up, the platelet counts went up and um, she did much better and ended up not having any adverse effects. Uh, the other interesting point is that this article was written in 2014, which was many, many uh, years after it was recognized that these two drugs didn't do well together. And you might say, well, why is that? And it's because 
uh, there might be a disconnect between the rheumatology uh, who's, uh, group who's taking care of the patient and the patient's primary care physician. There also might be uh, no actual surveillance uh, uh, around the time that the patient received both medications simultaneously. So this is something that really has to be uh, carefully considered. Now, other drugs that are considered uh, traditional synthetic DMARDs include hydroxychloroquine, uh, sulfasalazine and leflunamide or Areva. Um, these drugs uh, collectively are most widely used in um, chronic inflammatory arthropathies, including rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, um, what we used to call Reiter's syndrome, um, and also, uh, which is we now call reactive arthritis and other forms of uh, inflammatory arthritis. Uh, they do have uh, their own side effect profile, but in general are uh, well tolerated and often interestingly have been used with methotrexate, including sulfasalazine, which I find interesting because it has a sulfur moiety. Um, the drugs have their own side effect profile. They typically are not used as widely as methotrexate, but in some cases, uh, just these oral medications with or without methotrexate can lead to remission, particularly hydroxychloroquine is a mainstay in the treatment of patients with mild lupus. And there are, wild, there are uh, large studies which show that patients who have lupus when hydroxychloroquine is withdrawn have a, a high incidence of rebound of uh, symptomatic disease. Um, here's a, another case for your consideration. So Basically, this is case two, um, and this, this is what we've now learned about methotrexate. So, oh, let's see. Um, I don't know if I've already shown you case two, but a 29-year-old woman comes to your office complaining of dysuria for several days. No fever or chills. She has a history of rheumatoid arthritis, and her medications include diclofenac, low-dose prednisone, weekly low-dose methotrexate and oral contraceptives. How would you manage this patient? So the bottom line is uh, you don't want to give her Bactrim. So Bactrim is the combination of trimethoprine and sulfasalazine. Uh, that's a common non-generic name, but there are obviously uh, many other generics. Um, uh, you don't have to stop the methotrexate, but you would treat the UTI in other ways. You don't have to stop the prednisone. It would be advisable to get her uh, and to see a rheumatologist, but certainly an urgent room appointment is not necessary. Just use caution with how you treat this. So Keflex is the correct answer. Uh, okay, so here are the practical implications of methotrexate. First of all, uh, obviously now most people use um, uh, pre-defined uh, 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 protocols to order these drugs, such as in Epic. And hopefully um, the opportunity to make a mistake is very small. If you happen to still use a prescription pad or if you happen to be speaking with a pharmacist, be sure that you use the phrase once weekly. So you wanna take all of the methotrexate once on the same day each week. And it's been identified over and over again that patients come in and they've been taking one tablet three times a week instead of three tablets once a week. And in that situation, um, there's a much higher incidence of side effects. So I always actually have the patient, when I'm seeing them, tell me exactly how they're taking the medication. And you'd be surprised how often they're not taking it correctly. Uh, and it may be that it wasn't prescribed correctly or just that they didn't understand. So either way, we need to be sure that this is not the case. So. You should check drug interactions and contraindications electronically. Um, and also note that low-dose methotrexate is not nearly as likely to cause problems as high-dose. One of the things I noticed in my practice that drove me nuts, and it was an appropriate, in retrospect, um, way to approach things, is I would prescribe very low-dose methotrexate, and the patient, say, would be on naproxen, uh, well within the prescribing dose range. And invariably, I would get several... Uh, pharmacists on the line when I had a combination of low-dose 
uh, methotrexate and, uh, and acceptable dose of anti-inflammatory drugs to say, well, um, you know, anti-inflammatory drugs can cause renal insufficiency. And when we look it up in the uh, PDR, it says you shouldn't be using it with methotrexate. But what the PDR really means is you shouldn't be using it with high dose methotrexate. And that is absolutely true. So if a patient's getting uh, treatment with chemotherapy for breast cancer, no anti-inflammatory drug is acceptable. But it's routine for patients who are on low dose methotrexate to be taking anti-inflammatory drugs. So there's a big difference there. Now, practically, as far as other implications, um, you, should con you should counsel young women who uh, are going to go on methotrexate about the issue of spontaneous abortion and also uh, congenital malformations. And um, basically, uh, we advise that uh, methotrexate be started, at, uh, stopped if it's on board at least three months before patients begin to conceive um, if they're already on it because of concerns about those two issues. Um, this has been a bit more in the news recently because some of the patients who are on methotrexate for the treatment of their rheumatic diseases were unable to get these at their pharmacy because of some of the changes in the uh, uh, abortion laws. And um, it's not uh, really as effective in causing abortion if it's being used for that reason as higher dose treatment, but it, it certainly can cause uh, spontaneous uh, miscarriage uh, in any cohort of young women. So this is something that should be considered, especially since most of the rheumatic diseases epidemiologically are um, most likely to occur in younger uh, menstruating women. Uh, there has been a lot uh, written about uh, the uh, adverse effects of methotrexate if it's used in patients taking uh, some dose of alcohol regularly. And in fact, I had many patients who said, you know, I know methotrexate might help my joints, but I like drinking a, a glass of wine or two every night before dinner so much that I'd rather drink wine than have improvement in my joint pain. Uh, well, at that point, you start, you need to, to really start selling the notion that joint pain is an indication of destructive arthropathy in many cases and that it's worth it. But you can also, it turns out, uh, probably reassure them. And I say probably because we're not 100% sure, but studies more recently have suggested that uh, a very low uh, amount of alcohol ingestion uh, can certainly be considered. Um, so I don't uh, say they have to teetotal, but a, a patient who is uh, what one would label an alcoholic is probably not a good candidate for um, methotrexate at any point. Um, and in this regard, uh, the labs that are checked regularly are um, LFTs and a CBC, which generally are checked every three months. Uh, the one hint and a practical uh, thing to remember is if you can check uh, the LFTs either the, the day um, just after the drug is taken or just before the drug is taken, as opposed to say several days after, you're going to less likely see. Um, uh, some mild elevations of liver function. Um, rheumatologists don't really do much or recommend much in the way of liver biopsies now uh, on, in patients on methotrexate unless another uh, process is, ex is, uh, uh, is of concern. Uh, they do, uh, we do uh, work with hepatologists and sometimes do concur that liver biopsies are indicated though if we see persistent abnormalities in liver function more than twice normal for the long haul, but that's something to take up with a hepatologist down the road. Um, now, there are significant limitations uh, with traditional DMAR treatment, particularly for rheumatoid arthritis, which has led to the development of a variety of other drugs to treat this and other rheumatic diseases. So after five years, only about 60% of patients remain on methotrexate, uh, sometimes because they don't work, it doesn't work, sometimes because of side effects. Um, this figure uh, does vary study to study, but it's certainly true that many patients uh, have to or choose to discontinue this. Uh, joint erosions are found in 30% of patients after just one year of therapy with traditional DMARDs and in 70% of patients after two years of therapy. 
Now, it's also important to note that these figures vary depending upon the time of initial diagnosis. So if the patient is diagnosed and treatment has begun very early, uh, it's certainly not going to be, the percentages are not going to be nearly this high at two years after onset of therapy. The other thing that's worrisome is that complete remission is observed in only about 2% of patients after three years of therapy with traditional DMARDs. And over half of patients uh, in some studies are disabled after five years of therapy with traditional DMARDs. Again, that figure varies depending upon uh, the uh, early diagnosis, in which case it would be much, uh, the figure would be much lower than 50%, and also the uh, aggressive treatment with uh, traditional DMARDs, in which case it could be much lower than 50% too. Nonetheless, though, uh, even with the addition of traditional DMARDs to uh, the other non-steroidal and low-dose prednisone uh, drugs that have been available for years, uh, treatment was not uh, as appropriately effective as we would like. And um, for that reason, uh, about the end of the 1990s, um, biologic uh, disease-modifying drugs became available for use. Um, and truthfully, uh, I'd have to say that um, biologic uh, technology and the recognition that uh, biologic um, drugs, many of which are um, monoclonal antibodies, can address many, many different diseases has grown out of the uh, work using these drugs to treat uh, rheumatoid arthritis and related uh, diseases. Um, so I'm gonna present the same case twice uh, intentionally um, with the look at, not at the Trexate, but adalimumab, which is a biologic drug which had been prescribed to treat um, this patient's rheumatoid arthritis. So do you discontinue adalimumab when she gets um, uh, pregnant? Um, do you discontinue both? You, you now know the answer and we'll, we'll tell you why uh, as we go along. So the use of biologic drugs to treat rheumatoid arthritis came with the recognition that joint disease was mediated by cytokines, which are molecules that are secreted by inflammatory cells and a signal other um, cells to provoke bony erosions. And that's uh, demonstrated by this uh, uh, schematic. My, <laughs> this schematic has actually gotten a lot more uh, complicated actually in the year uh, 2023, as you might imagine. And I think sometimes the more complicated they get, it's an indication of the less that we know. But in this case, it's really the more that we know. And there've been more and more and more targets available to uh, allow for drug development to try to reduce uh, inflammation uh, and cure, or at least significantly improve the long-term outcome. So, the characteristics of the biologic DMARDs are um, they're produced by recombinant DNA technology. They are huge molecules. So uh, this is uh, why they have to either be injected, sub-Q, or infused. Uh, generally, they target, as I said, cytokines or their receptors, or they're directed against other cell surface molecules. Um, there are many, many disease-modifying biologic drugs now that are used in rheumatic disease. And I've been struck by how many have been developed uh, in just the five years since I was act actively practicing uh, rheumatology. And um, every day I'm reading about more and more drugs that are uh, being presented to the FDA for approval. Um, the TNF-alpha, inhibitors, that's tum tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors, were the first class of drugs that were identified and um, clinically uh, used. And these included in infliximab, etanercept, adalimumab, golimumab, and sertilizumab. These are either um, infusions, 
or subcutaneous injections um, and are highly effective at um, reducing disease activity. And this class of agents typically is used with methotrexate and studies uh, looking at these drugs independent of methotrexate do not show the same um, benefit. Uh, more recently, um, one of the first identified antagonists uh, of interleukin-1 receptor called anakinra has been uh, used particularly in juvenile um, uh, arthritis or also Stills disease. Uh, this drug has a ton of side effects, so we don't use it practically as much as some of the others. But more recently, we've turned to IL-6 receptors, uh, uh, antagonists including tocilizumab and another drug um, more recently called ser serilumab. Um, and we're using other biologic response modifiers, uh, which um, include the T-cell co-stimulation blocker, abatacit, and also CD20 B-cell depleting monoclonal antibodies, rituximab and bulimumab. Now, if these drugs aren't exactly household words, don't worry about it because this is the uh, actual distinction of rheumatologic care is that rheumatologic care is offered by people who are experts in these drugs, not only how to use them, but their side effect profile and how to change from one drug to the other. Um, that's really what where the field has been going. And it's uh, like a steam engine in this regard. Um, these drugs have revolutionized uh, the success with which anti-rheumatic uh, drugs have, uh, can offer. And patients who now are diagnosed with early rheumatoid arthritis can, in some, in many cases, expect to live a, a normal life uh, with a normal lifespan and normal or near normal joint function. Uh, unfortunately, about 10% of rheumatologic patients, despite everything that you can throw at them but the kitchen sink, still uh, cannot be adequately treated um, with any of these agents with the best of rheumatologists. And it's that 10% that has really led to uh, considerable research looking into different mechanisms of action that can be used uh, as a target uh, for additional uh, different uh, biologic DMARDs. I will say, and some other rheumatologists who are in my age group have agreed with me, that if these drugs had not been developed early in my career, I don't know if I would have been as uh, enthusiastic a rheumatologist as I am now, um, because these drugs uh, are so effective, uh, as I said, often with uh, methotrexate and have just provided so much hope for so many people. Uh, the thing I love about these drugs too, is it's a direct, these drugs are a direct uh, response to the uh, translation of scientific improvements. And in my lifetime, I actually worked in a lab where uh, the first interleukin molecules were ad identified. And then some of the people that were in the group uh, in the lab that I was working with went on to um, uh, bring these drugs to the clinical arena. And that, that has just got to be one of the most satisfying and exciting things that one could uh, be involved in in one's career. Um, as you see, um, these drugs are um, can be, particularly the anti-TNF biologics can have some mouse components in it. Infliximab is the one that is the most common um, at the or outset of using these drugs. And um, this has a significant uh, mouse component. And that's thought to be one of the reasons that there are some uh, infusion reactions. In contrast, adalimumab and etanercept have no uh, mouse components. And there is a far lower incidence of, um, well, adalimumab and etanercept are not infused, they're actually injected, but the frank allergic reaction does not happen with these drugs, but it does happen on occasion with infliximab. These other drugs never made it to uh, uh, the clinical arena. Now, what's the mechanism of action? So TNF monoclonal antibodies uh, bind to the soluble and cell-bound TNF. And as I said, there are chimeric and human versions. Chimeric are uh, mouse-human, human, human uh, versions are human-human. 
and they bind the soluble and cell bound TNF. Uh, there is another um, mechanism, and that is reflected in etanercept, in which the soluble TNF receptors that are floating around in the blood, um, when those receptors actually bind to the cells, uh, then that can lead to uh, inflammation. But the um, uh, molecules that are given in treatment actually bind to the soluble um, TNF receptors. And so they prevent the combination of the TNS receptor and the TNF from causing inflammation, which is a very novel um, mechanism of action. Now, um, this just lists the other in a different way and kind of shows which drugs are used often to treat which diseases. Um, it's interesting, uh, there is an overlap between uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus that we call, quote, rupus, uh, particularly uh, the joint disease in that group of patients is highly reminiscent of rheumatoid arthritis. And yet they have some of the other clinical manifestations of um, lupus. Um, Traditionally, uh, biologic agents are said to be contraindicated in patients with lupus since they can develop drug-induced lupus as a side effect. That said, patients with lupus uh, do require uh, disease-modifying drugs in the biologic arena because um, often their joint disease is refractory to any other form of control. Um, the other thing that's very interesting to me is that we've seen um, uh, the anti-CD20 B cell depletion um, effect of rituximab and a new drug called bolimumab, which is not new really anymore. It's been around for about 10 years in the treatment of lupus. And uh, these drugs, I think, have uh, further informed us of the uh, strong uh, relationship between um, the B cell uh, lymphocyte and uh, lupus. Now, we also use these drugs in psoriasis, and anybody who watches uh, any television for five minutes is going to hear about uh, the effectiveness of a plethora of drugs for the treatment of psoriasis that's come about in the last three or four years. And I sort of laugh when I think about that collectively, because I think what it means is that we've covered the rheumatoid arthritis field so well that there's not a huge uh, amount of uh, economic uh, room to squeeze any more money out of that market. In contrast, the drugs that focus on both the skin disease and the joint disease in psoriasis uh, have uh, taken off because there is uh, room for uh, development of those drugs. And so now we, we have a flood of drugs that we can use to treat both joints and skin. And it's been remarkably effective, uh, effective uh, these uh, drugs. Also, again, to my delight, because I really love the application of scientific discovery to the clinical arena. Um, when I was uh, at the end of my practice, we first began to recognize that uh, tw uh, IL-1223 uh, is an important player in, um, in promoting inflammation and in skin disease and psoriasis, as is IL-17. Uh, and look, at the drugs that have developed. Um, this the anti-TNF alpha inhibitors have been around, but what's really taken off in the last five to seven years are the IL-23 inhibitors, the IL-1223 inhibitor, and the IL-17 inhibitor. And these drugs were developed directly because of the recognition in the lab of the impact of these players on uh, active psoriasis and uh, inflammatory joint disease. Um, just to show you how important uh, these drugs are, and I'm going to really flip through this. Uh, this this shows uh, the effect of adding adalimumab and methotrexate to uh, ACR response rates. Uh, this is placebo and uh, with a methotrexate. And when you add 20, 40, or 80 milligrams, you can see in the uh, tan, red, and green bars how effective um, the uh, response is, the ACR20 is uh, the patient uh, who had 20% response, 50% response, and 70% response. These are the early figures. And also, uh, the same is true with radiographic progression 
the projected progression is in red, and then uh, the erosions and um, other uh, progressions are um, shown here. And you can see that there's huge benefit from adding uh, etanercept, infliximab, or adalimumab uh, to uh, just methotrexate. And then this drug um, shows that, uh, this slide shows that etanercept in long term leads to a dose reduction uh, of concurrent methotrexate. 55% were able to decrease or discontinue, 24% were able to discontinue, and only 14% remained on the same dose. That's an important study. Uh, likewise, um, we see that um, corticosteroids uh, uh, basically are significantly improved. 82% uh, of patients were able to discontinue uh, corticosteroids altogether who had a uh, long-term etanercept. Uh, and uh, likewise, 69% uh, uh, were 82% uh, decrease or discontinue, 69% discontinue, and 6% only had to increase it. And this group here, the 6%, is the group that really you can throw everything but the kitchen sink at and they're not going to respond. But this, this is an example of the profound efficacy that these new biologic drug, drugs have uh, given us uh, as far as treatment. We've also uh, recognized that rituximab. Uh, has the same type of um, benefit. Um, you can review these slides at, at your leisure, but uh, trust me, um, rituximab is uh, basically um, highly effective in a different way, uh, and it has sustained efficacy up to 48 weeks, a leading rheumatologist to use uh, this drug uh, every six months uh, instead of every week, as we would use in patients uh, on some of the other biologic drugs. Uh, this is a long uh, list. You can read about that and you can read about the comments, but it's pretty much what I have already gone over. And the list is growing, as I've said. So let me just briefly mention the adverse effects of biologics. Um, there's an increased risk of infection. There is still, um, the jury's not in about the increased risk of lymphoproliferative diseases uh, and melanoma. There is an increased risk of non-melanoma skin cancers, cancers, but probably not solid tumors. Uh, it's true that in patients with class three or four CHF, there can be increasing congestive heart failure. It does not, these drugs don't cause MS, but they may exacerbate or unmask MS. I mentioned earlier that they can be associated with drug-induced lupus. Um, some drugs have infusion reactions or injection site reactions. Um, these drugs are not likely to interfere with fetal development or pregnancy, so they are not contraindicated in patients who are pregnant. Um, and I did mention infusion reaction from infliximab and rituximab. Uh, interestingly, this is a great, uh, rituximab is a great drug for patients who have both rheumatoid arthritis and lymphoma, since as you know, rituximab is used uh, commonly to treat uh, lymphoma. Um, and Interestingly, the infection incidence is increased, but less than one would expect from rituximab, which is an effective B cell depleter. I'm sorry about the um, blurred uh, shadows, but the relative contraindications uh, include lupus, and I've already mentioned that briefly, multiple sclerosis. I would not start these drugs in someone who has known multiple sclerosis, or if they develop multiple sclerosis, I probably would stop the drug. Um, current or chronic, uh, chronic or recurrent infections, immunosuppression, history of TB or positive PPD untreated. If you have a patient who is in whom you've tested for TB and you should do that for every patient before they are started on these drugs. And if they're positive, you can treat them and then you can uh, start them on one of these drugs. Uh, we've mentioned congestive heart failure. You need to check hepatitis serologies before starting these drugs. Uh, Sometimes uh, hep B and hep C uh, can uh, explode when you start these drugs, especially rituximab. Um, it's not a contraindication because sometimes you can give uh, antiviral agents at the same time you're giving these drugs. Uh, and as I said, pregnancy is not a contraindication. So uh, case three is uh, teamwork. Uh, 
So the answer is you want to discontinue methotrexate because that can lead to uh, spontaneous abortions and malformations, but you can continue the adalimumab. Um, however, in this case, if the patient has drifted away from the rheumatologist and you've been just the one writing the prescription, or perhaps um, has not consulted her rheumatologist recently, I would encourage you to get her involved with her rheumatologist simply because uh, these are complex drugs and require uh, complex uh, uh, education, I think, about following them. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and just mention that we do use drugs um, that are targeted synthetic DMARDs, and that would include uh, the JAK3 inhibitors, such as uh, uh, tofacitinib, baricitinib, and upadacitinib. Um, these drugs are um, given orally, and they are associated with DBT. Uh, in addition to diarrhea, nausea, and alopecia. Um, and uh, they are orally administered small molecules. And the, the clever punchline on TV, at least the clever, clever marketing, is the injection. And in certain patients, they are very, very helpful. Um, the DVT is uh, dose-related. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, here's a blurb about COVID-19 and biologic therapy. Um, you can use it, but there's some different uh, uh, re recommendations based on uh, uncomplicated, complicated PCR positive tests, et cetera. Again, the ACR position is uh, outlined here. If you run into any problems, you can read these. Um, biosimilars is a whole new field in which we develop drugs that uh, are highly similar, uh, but not actually exactly the same but produce the same therapeutic um, outcomes. And that's another area that would qualify as a disease modifying anti-rheumatic drug. And finally, I wanna end this on the role of caregivers. So what we need from primary caregivers and patients uh, need is to identify patients early with possible RA uh, and or early uh, other inflammatory rheum rheumatic diseases and refer as soon as possible to a rheumatologist so that the disease can be confirmed and therapy can be uh, instituted. We're now recognizing that cure or complete sustained remission can occur in some patients uh, based on the speed with which uh, therapy is initiated. Um, it's important not only with our drugs, but with others to be aware for you to be aware of the drugs your patients are taking and in communication with your patient's rheumatologist about anything you think could be an adverse effect. Um, in patients on methotrexate, don't prescribe uh, trimethoprim and prescribe NSAIDs with caution. I encourage physicians just to go online and check on drug-drug interactions and also discuss contraception. And in patients on DMARDs, uh, particularly biologic DMARDs, be vigilant about signs or symptoms of infection and other possible uh, adverse effects. And feel free uh, to, to communicate with your rheumatologist. Um, I think the best uh, patient care is when a primary caregiver and a rheumatologist are on the same page. Um, the primary caregiver is taking care of um, the patient in general, but the rheumatologist is focusing specifically on the rheumatic disease. And uh, we can help. We want to help. But we also want to see these patients early and Maybe not so often because you can do a lot of that for us. Um, so in summary, this is a complex uh, group of drugs. I certainly couldn't cover the entire topic, but hopefully you've gotten enough information to whet your appetite and you'll have this uh, talk as a reference uh, going forward. Um, thanks a lot. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Upchurch. Um, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A box, the chat box, use the raise hand feature, and uh, that would allow you to speak directly to Dr. Upchurch. But in the case that you don't think of a question, but you think of one after this session, or you can always use the VC platform and submit a e-consult directly to Dr. Upchurch or any of our Maven project volunteers. We have a comment that just says, thank you, Dr. Upchurch, extremely helpful. Good. <laughs> And I know, as Dr. Upchurch said, there is a lot of uh, content. So if you review the slides tomorrow uh, from that email from Zoom, you can always uh, reach out to her through VC and say, hey, I have a question on this slide. All right. 
Um, I'll stall for another minute to see if we have any other last minute questions, but just a reminder that when you close out of this webinar, there'll be a CME survey. That you can click on um, on a tab on your browser, but if you miss that, you'll also be in the email tomorrow with Zoom, uh, from Zoom with the slide deck. And um, if anybody is sharing a computer, that's totally fine. However, Zoom will only recognize the person that is logged in, even if you add in like additional attendees to your registration, it only recognizes the person that logged in. So if somebody else is sitting next to you, please email me names and email address and I'll make sure that you one, get attendance and two, get the slide decks and the survey. All right, well, I think we are questionless. So thank you so much, Dr. Upchurch and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.